Where do the fine arts and the martial arts meet? In the work of Ying Ming Tu, an internationally known artist, he'll discuss his approach next on Global Perspectives. This is Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator John Bercia. Welcome to Global Perspectives. How does one find balance in today's difficult world? Ying Ming Tu, also known as Tu Tu, is an internationally acclaimed visual artist who combines the fine arts and the martial arts in his spiritual practice. Welcome to the show, Tu Tu. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Take us back to when you first began to learn martial arts. What was the reason for that, and how did it work for you? Um, I was inspired to practice martial art like any young person is to revenge. Re revenge was very important, uh, motivating me to do that, because when I was uh, in junior high school, the second years, um, I was bullied by uh, three classmates, you know. Out of that uh, uh, a traumatic uh, experience, so when I entered to the high school, I decided I want to uh, study martial art. First, I studied uh, Kung Fu, uh, White Crane, uh, and then the White Crane teacher happened to be a policeman uh, teaches Judo in my high school. So that's how I uh, start uh, learning uh, the uh, judo because uh, I want to be uh, strong physically, and uh, I hope one day I will revenge those kids that beat me up. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever do that? Did you ever take vengeance on them? Actually, I did. I I was uh, because my father was uh, uh, also a judo black belt, and so he taught me to. Uh, he trained me when I was a little boy, so uh, so I was very quickly uh, got my black belt uh, within you know eight months you know because I was so uh, I was very diligent I was really passionate about to uh, to become a, a very good judoist so uh, it's very interesting so I end up uh, I met. Uh, uh, come back and uh, fight the, one of the two, actually, who had beat me up, and I went out and beat them up, too. But uh, very interesting is one of the leader of those three uh, uh, friends that one of them uh, later came to my dojo to study uh, judo, you know. Uh, so he came in, I already black belt, so I said, well, this is a great opportunity. So I was able to <laughs> fulfill my <laughs> revenge, you know. Uh, but anyway, it's an interesting thing has happened is uh, this friend, his name is Young, uh, Mr. Young, he ended up becoming my best friend, hmm. you know. Uh, out of, uh, uh, later we get to know each other very well, and then he become my, one of my uh, uh, closest friends. So, so you, you built that personal bridge, which yes. was a wonderful yeah. story. Yeah. And then you entered into the service of General Chiang Kai-shek. Tell us about that experience. Yes. Um, Presumably because of your judo skills, among other things. Yeah, I was dropped as a military police, and uh, uh, usually uh, in, a, in a service, they want to uh, pick uh, anybody who has a pure background and uh, also have some kind of martial art uh, expertise. So I think that at that time, I happened to fit that criteria. Mm -hmm. And uh, so usually in military police, you'll be trained four months. And I was, uh, uh, I went to additional two months to a training, six months. Mm -hmm. And then my work was, I was being put into the, uh, 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 to, the contingent of the uh, Chiang Kai-shek's uh, uh, presidential uh, compound to protect uh, Chiang Kai-shek and his son, Jiang Jingguo's family, and his grandchildren. Mm -hmm. you know. And you did that for how long? I did that for uh, 24 months, uh, reduced six months, so 18 months. 
18 months. Yeah. And then what happened after you left military service? Did you have a sense of direction? Did you want to become uh, a documentary maker, uh, a photojournalist, the things you eventually did, or you weren't sure at that time? I think that my experience uh, as, as a, a bodyguard and that uh, experience was, uh, it's, it was a moment of a, a, a awakening for me because um, you were being trained to be a killing machine and uh, you were under so much pressures and um, so uh, so under the circumstance I realized that um, I was not happy you know uh, so I realized that the only way that I can get out of military service is to uh, empower myself by knowledge so I ended up uh, went to uh, uh, study history in Taiwan University, you know, uh, major in history. And you can, actually it's interesting, uh, Chiang Kai-shek, the, the last time, uh, the last day when he passed, I was on duty. Mm. You know, I was, uh, uh, that was uh, 1975, mm -hmm. uh, April 5th, and uh, I was on duty from uh, midnight to two. So. And it was a very dramatic night because usually the weather would be pretty nice, but that night was half uh, blowing winds and then uh, thunders and all that. And I have to check, uh, and then suddenly you have a, 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 a people driving limousine taxi uh, coming in, and I have to check their ID, and they were a general or some politician. Mm -hmm. So I knew that uh, Chiang Kai shek had passed away, you know, and that was. Uh, uh, very interesting for me because at the time I was brainwashed so much that that I was crying. You know, the whole nation was crying because you know he was our ultimate leader. You know, so from there to going to Taiwan University to study history, I was I was able to read a lot of original uh, declassified document to understand what's going on with the history of modern, you know, history, and then so. Uh, that was very helpful for me to, you know, uh, learn about uh, from that kind of a propaganda mind to be somebody who has a critical thinking mm -hmm. about what happened. So. so when did you move in the direction of the fine arts? Um, I, I didn't, uh, actually I came to, I was working in the 60 minutes of Taiwan. Uh, uh, before I came to the United States uh, to study film and television at UCLA. Um, so I, I didn't have a plan to become an artist, you know, uh, until I was in, I was supposed to set up some TV station in New York, and uh, I, I got married, and, and uh, then my, I lost my job. Um, my wife left me, and so uh, I, at the time I lived in the East Village and it was uh, snowing and very difficult, I almost died. And uh, during that time, I started looking for something to draw, and I was drawing my, a portrait of my dad. And then after that, I feel much better. Um, so from that, I made a commitment to myself and said, okay, I wanna be, uh, uh, artist and actually to be artist was my uh, childhood dream. I was very gifted as a child, you know, but because my father died when I was 13 and I was the eldest son, so I didn't have the opportunity to, to uh, fulfill my own dream. And so at that time, I feel like to be an artist is a way to heal myself. So that's how I started. And at the time I was 34 years old. Tell us about some of your adventures along the Silk Road. Yeah, the Silk Road, I was at the time, before I became artist, I was 1986, and uh, the Minister of Culture of China at the time, uh, Wang Meng, and he invited uh, uh, you know, a, a delegation of, of famous Chinese-American artists. At the time, they were from either from Taiwan or Hong Kong, 
and or somebody who is already uh, live in the uh, United States. So, uh, so they received it us. At the time, I was just journalist for a newspaper. Mm -hmm. So I went along, and so they took us, uh, they received us from Beijing, and they traveled us from uh, Beijing, uh, Xi'an, Lanzhou, Dunhuang, and Ulumuchi. Mm -hmm. So we went there, and then we, from there, we traveled from uh, Beijing to Shanghai and then to Huangshan. So at the time they were uh, try to um, it's they try to open up to the artists uh, from the West or from the other country to show them that we're not so bad, you know. Mm -hmm. so. And what was the most exciting or enlightening aspect of that experience for you? For me, it was uh, the circle what I, what I have witnessed was the Dunhuang. Dunhuang was the, uh, has all the Buddha's a big statue of cake and uh, who has all the uh, uh, mirror, that, a Buddhism mirror in Dunhuang. And uh, we were privileged, so they were open a lot of caves. So for me, those are pretty amazing experience to see those statue, the Buddha mm -hmm. statue, and and the, the energy and, and the sacredness of that, and I was it was moving me very deeply. Yeah. When when did you start thinking about the fusion of the fine arts and the martial arts? Was that something that developed over time, or did you always have you always had an appreciation for for both? You said you had natural inclinations as an artist when you were young and you went into martial arts training fairly early. Yeah, I always fascinated by uh, how body can move, you know, and I think that, so uh, for me as an artist, I always interesting how, uh, how, how body can move in a certain way, and, and I always uh, really interested in investigate that. So, um, so I would say, you know, when I was doing my, uh, uh, graduate school uh, thesis I was doing called the story of breakdancing, mm -hmm. you know, so I was fascinated how the kids and during the 80s, they can move around breakdancing, you know, <laughs> so I did a documentary about that. Um, so that was something that fascinated me. And later on, I was playing soccer for, you know, almost 20 some years and, and also using soccer as a way to express myself, you know, so, uh, and now I'm very interested in tennis, so I use tennis to, to, uh, to find out how come, you know, you can move certain ways. So I think that I try to translate the body movement into a, a sort of kind of a, a, a spiritual level. You know, mm -hmm. so. so tell us about your art today. You, you've had exhibits all over the world. Mm. Everyone knows your name. and. What, what is it that you do primarily and what inspires you? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I think you were asking me uh, in the beginning that uh, I was, um, I was, the first project I did is called Maoology, you know, it's called, so I did a whole series of uh, 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 a painting, large painting of Mickey Mouse Mao, uh, meow Meow Mao, Mao as a woman, Chap Mao, Tiananmen Square Mao. At the time, I just tried to, uh, uh, using uh, what I learned from the West uh, to search my own personal identity. Uh, so I thought it would be interesting to uh, using uh, the cultural reference and uh, uh, different media, different surface to create art. So. Uh, so it's interesting that I did uh, this uh, one of the uh, one of the most famous images I created uh, called a Mickey Mouse. So now I look back, and you know, at the time uh, during the early '90s, nobody was doing that. So uh, so now I look back and say, uh, for a communist Mao, uh, 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 China now practice capitalism. Mm -hmm. You know, so a Mickey Mouse at the simple of it, and I thought that was a, a really a interesting irony, right? So, so the whole serial project was about me too to looking for identity as a, you know, Asian American uh, person. And um, so from that, it's based on that, that work has come from 
uh, somebody who wanted to be recognized, right? So, uh, the, and so I using an icon, basically as a conceptual uh, project, and I did a 50 of different monumental pieces with different media, different cultural reference. But now the work I'm doing is completely different. Uh, by from starting from the ego to deal with my anger, to deal with my suffering, to deal with you know whatever that is as a young person uh, face. Now I am trying the current work in the last ten years. I'm trying to do something out of put my ego in a proper position, and I am doing a portrait of a real people who I met around you know around the every corner of the world. And I thought, well, since before I using all kinds of medium and bigs, now what I'm going to do? I'm going to do something very simple. I just want to have a silver pencil and color paper. I'm going to just draw them through meditation. So, so I basically, from a person outward, now I'm coming inward. Mm -hmm. you know? So, I, so those, all this current project, I work through meditation. So I'll be sitting quietly for 45 minutes. I only draw when my mind is really quiet and very peaceful. You know? And it's contrast to the previous work, it usually I was fanatic, I was angry, I was pumping the canvas, I was trying to do something like that. You know? so. How do people respond to your art, especially from country to country? Uh, I think that every place is um, uh, uh, differently. I'm sure that like Mao is more like a cultural kind of uh, uh, reference, and um, people respond to uh, them. Uh, they can more identify with that. And the current work, I think, it is, is, is more about calmness. It's about feelings of sacredness, you know. So that's, that's a different feeling mm -hmm. from the different work, the different periods of work, I think, you know. You say you've drawn people from everywhere, how, how do you select someone? Or, or does it just happen and you know that that's someone you want to draw? Yeah, well, yeah, I, it's interesting because um, every situation uh, are different because I travel a lot um, and I will encounter very different kinds of people and sometimes just by how they walk on their gesture and I will ask them to uh, take a picture of them. You know, I can use the iPhone or do anything and. Usually, I cut them uh, unnoticed, you know. And so, it's all by very intuitive feelings, you know. So, I, if I feel I met this person, suddenly something tells me, so you should capture that, and then I would just do that, you know. And I never tell the person that I'm going to do a portrait of him, mm. you know. So, like for example, I met. Um, a person in my temple, and the way how he walked, he walked like a nobleman, you know. <laughs> and I said, hey, you know, I, I didn't know your name, can I take a picture of you? And I did that, you know. And later on, I find out that he was a, a Zen master, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a chaplain in a hospital, you know. And one time, uh, Angela was, uh, at the time, uh, was an ED of uh, Western Justice Center. And we will have a subject matter talking about life and death. And uh, uh, this Zen master, Golden Green, it happened to be invited. So I thought I put the portrait out of the, you know, outside the, you know, uh, the hallway of. Uh, so he, he, when he looked at it, he was shocked, you know. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think that I, the whole series of this work are not about flatter anybody or try to uh, criticize anybody. Uh, it's more about, can I have no bias? Can I be completely pure in the mindset to, to, uh, to draw, to illuminate a faces that had moved me in the first time when I saw it? And, and what is your goal with all of these pieces of art? Are you trying to amass a large collection that will actually go someplace on a permanent basis? Or is this something that you want to travel with so that everyone has a chance to see them? Yeah, I, th I think in the beginning I just thought it was just, it's the way 
that I can create a mural of, of all humanity. And I thought it would be great to, the whole idea is to have this kind of synergy of vibration. You know, I, I think all these faces had a common humanity uh, as, as about the authenticity of the being, a human being. And I thought it would be great to create this insulation of this Henry ape of faces of uh, uh, man, woman, age, different kind, famous, not famous, and all age to be together. And through my, my uh, calmness, uh, uh, the pencil dancing, drawing, that I can bring together some kind of totality of a vibration of light. And that's my purpose. You know? so, uh, and and yeah. you, you engage in your art only when you're inspired, so you don't do it in a routine way. Because some artists get up every day and have to paint or do something from X time to X time, but you, it doesn't sound like that's the way you work. Uh, I, I actually, what I do is with a portrait, always have to intentionally s set on my mind to be quiet and I do them. But I also do other kind of drawing. Like I would draw, like I say, I would be drawing something, uh, a martial art or somebody play tennis or somebody play soccer, or I was staging it so I can draw them. So I, I am very disciplined. So I would do uh, sort of ink brush or do other kinds of art, so, so yeah. Tell us about your personal meditation. How do you meditate? Uh, I usually, uh, I actually already make meditation a part of my living. So um, usually I, I get up in the morning, I, you know, I always want to be able to be quiet in my mind. And so I would usually sit uh, at least 20 to 45 minutes. Uh, then by sitting, I would have some sense of what's going on for today. And usually Angela would be, my wife would sit with me and we would discuss what we're gonna do. Uh, also, I s usually when I, s then I go to draw, be before I have to make art, I sit. And when I finish art, I sit. And then when I go and play tennis, I sit. I play tennis, you know. And then afterwards, I, you know, I clean up my shoes, I sit a little bit. So it become, sort of kind of ritual for me. So, so basically what I'm really doing is, I, can I be, before, I, before the game, okay, and after the game, can I become a better person when I finish the game? Or when I finish in my drawing, am I, am I calmer and a sort of a little better than I was before? At what age did you feel you started to understand yourself much better? And does that process ever end, or is it a never-ending effort to understand yourself as you go through life? Yeah, I think life is constant. I think for me, it's always constant about uh, clean up yourself, and really, uh, I think there's infinite uh, of, of yourself because we are constantly being seduced being, uh, to be challenged and we're facing the you know a difficulty all the time so I think there's no way that you can say now I'm a better person already but not I think that it's something that you have to be very aware of it until your last breath I think mm -hmm. thank you so much for joining us today Tutu thank you and thank you for Global Perspectives I'm John Bercia we'll see you next time